That architecture is extraordinarily complex. It, quite frankly, doesn't make a lot of sense if you're trying to go first to the moon, this time to beat China. Um, it does not make sense to do that. This was unthinkable. The man who first unveiled the Artemis program now admits that the U.S. could lose the moon race to China. Former NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstein has openly criticized SpaceX, saying the HLS and orbital refueling plans are overly complex, risky, and the main reason America is falling behind. But Elon Musk isn't staying silent. So, is the U.S. really at risk of losing to China? And how did Musk respond? Let's find out in today's episode of Alpha Tech. On September 3rd, 2025, Senator Ted Cruz of Texas convened a Senate Commerce, Science, and Transportation Committee hearing. The focus was clear, setting NASA's legislative priorities for reauthorization, shaping a national space strategy to counter China, and securing America's leadership beyond Earth. The challenge, however, is that NASA still doesn't have a permanent administrator. Sean Duffy is only serving in an acting role while the administration searches for a nominee to be confirmed by the Senate. That leaves some of NASA's most critical gears idle. And in a race that's moving faster than ever, every day without strong leadership only makes the competition tougher. To fill that gap, former NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine was called in to testify as an expert witness. He's the one who first turned the vision of sending humans back to the moon into reality through the Artemis program. And he brings nearly five years of leadership experience plus deep knowledge of America's space strategy. His role at the hearing was to offer insight into current policies, the challenges ahead, and especially the roadmap for the moon race against China. However, despite his expertise, his remarks ended up stirring quite a storm in the community. At first, he acknowledged that NASA was making good progress, especially with the SLS. He said, Yes, it has had its problems in the past. It has been expensive. It had, it had overruns, all those things. But it's behind us. It's done. We need to use it. A true talent in management, he brushed aside just how costly the program of his former agency really is, and he knows perfectly well. From its start in 2011 through 2022, NASA has poured about $23.8 billion into developing the SLS. The total cost of Artemis, including SLS, Orion, and related infrastructure, is projected to reach $93 billion between 2012 and 2025. Each SLS launch is estimated at 2 to $4.1 billion, making it one of the most expensive rockets ever built. And that's not even counting its launch system. The mobile launch platform, especially Mobile Launcher 2 for the SLS Block 1B, was originally contracted in 2019 for $383 million, but has now ballooned to $1.8 to $2.7 billion, four to six times the original estimate. Mobile Launcher, one cost around $1 billion as well, mostly due to modifications carried over from the old Constellation program. These costs pile up from construction, redesigns, and endless delays. With ML2, Congress recently approved more funding just to keep Artemis 4 and 5 alive, since SLS Block 1B requires ML2 and nothing else. To put that into perspective, this money could fund SpaceX to build several new launch towers and probably finish them faster than NASA ever could. Just look at Launchpad 2 at Starbase. It's already nearing completion, likely ready by the end of this year, and construction only started back in April 2024. Pretty insane speed, right? And when it comes to Orion, he said, The Orion crew capsule is not only usable today, but uh, ultimately, the cost is going down because more and more of it is reusable every time we use the Orion crew capsule. Oh, perhaps he forgot a few things. Since its inception in 2006, Orion's development costs are estimated at around $20 billion by 2022, including the Lockheed Martin partnership. The Artemis mission in 2022, which carried no crew, cost between $1 and $1.5 billion. Crewed missions like Artemis II are projected to cost even more, given the additional safety and testing requirements. By 2025, the total cost of Orion under Artemis is expected to reach about $40 billion, and that figure will only climb higher. So when he says costs will go down with reuse, it feels a bit disconnected from reality. 
Not to mention, in NASA's 2026 budget proposal under the Trump administration, there was already talk of winding down further development of SLS and Orion after Artemis III, shifting priorities toward commercial systems like SpaceX's Starship as a more cost-effective alternative. However, his remarks really stirred controversy when he turned to criticizing SpaceX, arguing that its slow progress could ultimately cause the U.S. to lose the space race to China. But I will say what we don't have today. Here's what we don't have today. We don't have a landing system for the moon. What he was really saying is this. SLS and Orion are ready to go, but SpaceX's Starship, HLS, not yet. He also criticized NASA's big decision to focus on SLS instead of investing earlier in a lunar lander, especially during that messy transition period when there was no confirmed administrator. That gap in leadership, he argued, left the program without clear direction at a critical time. Then he laid out how the Artemis architecture actually works and why it's so complicated. First, a starship has to be launched as a fuel depot in Earth orbit. Then, week after week, more starships maybe up to 20 according to NASA's plan, need to be launched just to fill it up with liquid methane and oxygen. Only after that is a crewed starship ready to head to the moon. The tricky part? Cryogenic refueling in orbit has never been done before. It's risky, it relies on a flawless string of launches, and it's still an unproven technology. Bridenstine made it clear, there are serious hidden dangers, and the whole plan depends on everything going perfectly, which, in space, is never guaranteed. Basically, what he said wasn't wrong, but here's the thing. He's not the one tracking the actual progress of the HLS, or the orbital refueling project. That's why his comments sparked so much debate. Honestly, I bet he wouldn't be criticizing SpaceX if he knew what's really going on. First, on July 31st, Acting Administrator Duffy said he spoke with SpaceX President Gwyn Shotwell and she gave a guarantee that Starship HLS will be ready on schedule for Artemis III. And it seems that's true. Even though SpaceX hasn't officially announced updates, some leaks have come out showing real progress. On August 24th, two Starship HLS seats were spotted at Starbase. That means the whole structure is done, and now they're working on assembling the interior. There are still two years to go until Artemis III, so honestly there's nothing to worry about. Second, on the whole orbital refueling complexity thing, Elon Musk fired back right away. SpaceX will do orbital refueling several times next year, with Starship version 3. Because we're basically just docking with ourselves, it's way easier than docking with the space station, something we already do several times a year. Yeah, it might sound a little crazy at first, but there's solid evidence to back it up. Jim probably didn't know that SpaceX actually conducted a cryogenic fuel transfer test, specifically liquid oxygen, between tanks on a Starship during Integrated Flight Test 3, or IFT-3, on March 14, 2024, makes sense, since he wasn't NASA administrator anymore at that point. This test was done under a $53.2 million NASA contract, signed back in 2020, aimed at developing on-orbit cryogenic fluid management technology. They transferred about 10 tons of liquid oxygen from a header tank to the main tank in microgravity collecting crucial data on fluid behavior, including slosh dynamics and boil-off. Both NASA and SpaceX called the test a success, proving that in-space fuel transfer really is possible. Next up, let's talk about Starship version 3 and how the fuel math works for the HLS mission. This version stands 124.4 meters tall, holds around 1,600 tons of propellant, and can haul over 100 tons to orbit in reusable mode. In expendable mode, it could lift close to 300 tons, but for HLS, we'll stick with the more realistic reusable configuration. So, what does HLS actually need? About 1,425 tons of propellant, liquid oxygen, and methane to get from low Earth orbit to NRHO, land on the moon, and then return. Add in 5 to 10% for boil-off, and the total climbs to around 1,500 tons. A Starship Tanker version 3 can bring roughly 150 tons of fuel up to LEO in reusable mode. Technically, it might push closer to 200 tons without heat shields or landing legs, but let's stay conservative at 150. To make it all work, SpaceX plans to launch an orbital depot, essentially a fuel storage Starship, which tankers will fill up before topping off HLS. 
That depot itself takes one launch. And with 150-ton tankers, fully loading HLS with 1,500 tons, works out to about 10 to 12 flights in total. One depot, plus 9 to 11 tankers. And if things are optimized, say HLS only needs 1,200 tons and each tanker carries 200, then the number drops to 8 to 10 flights. One depot, plus 7 to 9 tankers. But that's not the end of the story. Musk has already revealed Starship version 4, a monster stack at 142 meters tall, with the upper stage alone stretching 61 meters. It can haul 200 tons to orbit and store an incredible 2,300 tons of fuel. With that kind of capacity, you'd only need as few as five tanker flights to fill HLS. And that lines up exactly with Musk's own predictions. So the bottom line? It's nowhere near the 20 flights Jim Bridenstine warned about. The real bottleneck in Artemis isn't SLS, Orion, or even SpaceX. It's about trust and execution, not the math. And with version 3 test flights expected to kick off in early 2026, the timeline for orbital refueling is already right on track. On top of that, SpaceX has racked up serious experience in orbital docking. 27 automatic docks with the ISS using Dragon capsules since 2019 including 10 fully autonomous ones with zero issues. That's why Musk says docking two starships will actually be easier than docking with the ISS. And he's got a solid point. The design is fully synchronized. Both starships are built by SpaceX and use the same docking system, likely a probe and drogue setup, which makes alignment and connection much simpler than with the ISS, where multiple international interfaces complicate things. The orbits are nearly identical, both starships will operate in low Earth orbit, so rendezvous is straightforward, unlike the ISS, which demands precise adjustments in altitude and inclination. So, complex or simple, we won't really know until it's tested in space. Are you excited to see Starship's orbital refueling test next year? Drop a 2026 in the comments if you are. Back at the hearing, despite all the criticism, the truth is this. Without SpaceX, America would already be losing to China. Bridenstine made it clear that he sees the Lunar Gateway as the real priority, a future outpost in lunar orbit, where international and commercial partners could gather, providing flexible access to the entire moon whenever needed. Well, once again, he's backing a program that was already on the chopping block in the 2026 budget cuts, dismissed as simply unaffordable. In short, the former NASA administrator never really had long-term faith in Starship. But we do. We see further. Starship is not just a rocket, it's the guiding flame of human ambition.